I'm Andy Nidell, and this is another great war weapon special. Uh, now we've done a whole bunch of these on different weapon, different rifles, and different handguns used by several of the different warring nations, all in collaboration with Othias from his awesome channel C and Arsenal. And Othias is here with us today. Othias, can you please say hi to everybody out there? Howdy, everybody! Nice to see you again, Indy. Okay, well, uh, do you want to jump in with American uh, rifles or American small arms, or where do you feel like going? Uh, I say let's go small to big, so let's do the handguns first. All right, okay, well, let's get started. What do you got? All right, so today uh, we're going to talk about some handguns from the U.S., and I'm going to start with probably the standard issue that most people are familiar with and probably doesn't need a lot of exposition. That's going to be the good old U.S. Model 1911. This is a Colt product in 45 ACP. Now, uh, let me go ahead and get you a closer look at that gun. Now, this is a big gun. For a big hand, I'm, I'm much larger than the average soldier back then, so this is a bit of a hold on. Uh, the reason the U.S. went with this is because they were worried about stopping power, which is something that's almost sort of joked about nowadays because most people have moved over to 9mm Parabellum. But realistically, it is a large bore, heavy hitting 45 ACP cartridge, single stack, seven rounds in the mag. If you really were trying, you could get one in the chamber and then keep her cocked and locked with that safety over on this side. Now, uh, this gun was mostly not popular with the Europeans due to the very heavy recoil, but the US seemed to like it just fine. Uh, overall, it's a very good shooter in a lot of ways. They have a very linear trigger, they have a very comfortable grip, and the, by the way, you can look at it, it's a modern handgun. Uh, there's guns today that still use the same locking system, although simplified. The cartridge has remained popular in some circles, although, like I said, people have moved more towards 9mm Parabellum these days because it has the right output for the right recoil and follow-up. But there's fans of the 1911 right now, lots of them. And so if you stop and think about some of the other handguns we've seen and doing this series with you guys and then over at our show, there's not a lot of guns that stack up this well compared to modern firearms. Yes, there are improved guns out now, but it took pretty much until the 60s and 70s to get away from... Uh, this particular design in any significant way. So this was very much ahead of the curve for its day. Now, when did this enter enter service? Uh, well, 1911 is easy and enough right there. Straight off the bat, straight yep. off so the So it's okay. just off the model number. Uh, it was developed because of a gun that I have here, actually. Um, here, let's just go ahead and get to the next gun while I'm talking about it. So I'll put this 1911 aside. And then this is actually going to be probably one of the lesser common guns. You're not going to see a lot of them in U.S. service, although they do turn up in photos. This is the old Colt New Army. So this was a 38 caliber single and double action revolver with a swing out cylinder. Let me get you a closer look at that. So this would have been common for like Spanish-American War period. Swing out cylinder, simultaneous eject rapid reloading. Although it did have some mechanical problems that leads to it basically walking out of what's called time. And what that is is, here let me make sure that she's absolutely empty. So when we index the cylinder by either pulling back the hammer or by pulling that trigger all the way through for double action, the way the cylinder rotates over, well that's done by what's called a hand or a pawl in here, and it presses up on the back of that cylinder and it's got to stay in alignment with the bore or else you start to shave metal or worse, detonate you know, and actually clip the inside of the barrel and cause, you know, shattered cylinder or something like that. Well, the thing about timing is when you have a swing out cylinder, this also becomes a factor in timing the gun because if this part gets loose, well, you're going to be walking off that bore. And these guns were not designed well because essentially the rotation of the cylinder, you can see it's rotating to the left. Well, it's pushing against this gate trying to open. So over time, the more you use this gun, the more likely it is to walk out. But was that in? Was that what was in regular service before 1911, or how? how you this would have been standard before 1911. Before that, we had you know single action army. We were still doing 45 caliber. U.S. liked a heavy, broad, like a big, wide bullet, lots of weight, lots of knockdown, which made a lot of sense when you had a single action gun because you don't have rapid follow up shots. You want each one to count. But then when they came out with this, well, they thought we can get a much handier gun, and I assure you, it is a very handy feeling revolver. Uh, and they go with a lighter cartridge because we can pump out more rounds and reload much faster, so why not? Well, when occupying the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, they were having trouble with uh, sort of determined attackers with spears, and while they were able to successfully kill them with this gun, they were not stopping them quickly enough to avoid getting poked themselves. And so there would be a temporary period where they tried going back over to a Colt single and double action in 45. Uh, that was short-lived. The Marines would go for what's the Colt 1909 um, and sort of a 45 long Colt cartridge. 
But ultimately, when we went for the next handgun, we went with that automatic 1911 pistol chambered in 45 ACP, which was a nice, now at the time that was fairly hot, but nowadays we think of it as a very slow round with a heavy hit. Um, and so it was very popular for sort of a one shot, one kill mindset. Um, and it sounds good until really you get into a modern shooting understanding in which follow-up shots count a lot more than just sort of precisely aiming one good round. Um, and so fierce recoil, but honestly still not as bad as you'd think because it has a very well-designed grip, very good ergonomics. And this gun would stick around for the U.S. all the way through World War II with very minor modifications. Um, now, this did not keep up production. So it's not just the 1911 handgun and a handful, mostly, by the way, still in naval service with these new armies. These were not common on the battlefield. Um, what they ended up doing instead is the U.S. wanted a common cartridge for everything. They wanted 45 ACP in their handgun and in their revolvers, in their pistol and revolvers. So the problem with that is 45 ACP is what's known as a rimless cartridge, and most revolvers would use a rimmed cartridge so that they could be contained in the cylinder and extracted properly. And it's just a much easier setup because once you have a rimless cartridge, it's going to try to fall through the cylinder unless you do something to retain it. Well, uh, Colt and Smith and Wesson rose to that challenge uh, with the models 1917. So these are two very similar looking large caliber revolvers, but realistically they are different in design internally and with their releases and things like that. But they were both called the Model 1917, one provided by Colt, one provided by Smith & Wesson, and they both used a half moon clip. I have some dummy rounds here, so let me get you in closer on that. So you'd have two halves of the moon for your six shots, and then what you would do is with your Colt or your Smith & Wesson, you would take your half moon, load one half, load the other half, so you have rapid loading, and it also now retains a rimless cartridge inside the revolver. So you get two benefits out of this. You get to keep a rimless cartridge in a revolver so that you can share with your 1911 ammo, and you get rapid loading. And this works for both guns, uh, who both have, again, slightly different actions, but generally the same principle. They're both very large, single and double action guns. Now those are snap caps, they are fake ammunition, they can't do anything. Again, single action, we've talked about this before. I pull back the hammer and then I very gently touch the trigger and it's already ready to go. That's very good for accurate, slow fire. Or if you're in a hurry, you just pull that trigger all the way through. However, at that point, your finger is overcoming all the spring tension in there all together through the pull, so that can throw off your shots. But both of these guys would have been available. I believe it's like 150,000 of each were made during that war. Um, and they would stick around, both actually stuck around through World War II all over again. So if there's, so there's like 300,000 of them total and a bunch more of the earlies. Uh, so this, would this account for the majority of the small arms that the Americans had in 1917, 1918? Or was there a bunch of other stuff? Predominantly, you are going to see in most war photography the 1911. The U.S. did a pretty good job of producing these guys. Uh, plenty were cranked out. It's just that, again, a war of attrition, you've got to crank out everything you can get. So why let an assembly line sort of sit there stalled? Both of these big revolvers, so the 1911 gets you know contracted for by the government. They start producing it. Um, Colt Springfield, those guys are looking at it, and they try to ramp up for the war, and they do to a certain degree, but the cost of setting up an entirely new factory versus taking an existing commercial assembly line and adapting it, well, that's a big benefit because both of these guns were in commercial production, albeit not with this particular barrel or this exact grip or something, but both of these were being marketed as big bore revolvers, and actually versions of both of these would be sold to, say, Canada and Britain in 455. So they were already available in a large caliber, a large cylinder bore. Uh, all it took was adding that special technology of the half moon clip, and then later nowadays you can still get full moon clips are more popular, where it's the whole six in one go. Um, it's just that its standard issue then was the half moon so that it would lay flatter on your hip instead of having that big wad of cartridges that sort of stuck out whenever you put them on your belt. Now, in terms of, uh, of the, were they made in, I mean, let's say uh, the 1911, was it just in like a single factory that was responsible for all of it, or were there several factories all over the U.S.? Because we saw like with some of the French guns, you know, it had things coming from Spain and stuff, for example. The U.S. production could get pretty weird because when we look at, uh, this is a very odd thing to sort of talk about with U.S. arms during the war because the U.S. was a big arms provider commercially for a lot of countries. We've seen their weapons turning up all over in the Great War. But the interesting thing is that U.S. had a special relationship 
a generous relationship with Colts. And so generally you tend to think of productions of machine guns and particularly the 1911 coming out of Colt, although Springfield would also try to produce as much as possible in addition. However, you start to get into some interesting things when you try to produce these guns outside of Colt commercially, because then Colt gets very defensive of not wanting to have another producer touch on what they're making. As a matter of fact, there would be in the machine gun world, we're going to do an episode on this later, or no, we already did. We did a uh, Browning automatic rifle episode. Colt was very protective of sort of producing the BAR, even though they were doing a terrible job of it. And so finally the government had to force them to give away the ability to produce that gun because they're so far behind on their contracts. So uh, the 1911 could have been produced in greater numbers if it had been expanded to more manufacturers, but generally, no, you're looking at like Springfield and Colt as the big producers of this gun. How good were they? I mean, these three, say compared with some of the, some of the handguns we've seen from the European nations and stuff. Well, a lot of times when we talk about uh, firearms in either World War I or World War II, especially being in the U.S., you get a lot of sort of American exceptionalist ideals. Like people always like, the U.S. had the best this or the best that. And I try to sort of not over favor U.S. weapons in our own series because there's a lot of stories out there for other guns that had plenty of inventiveness to them. But I will say the U.S. market probably had the best handgun market. Um, we've worked with a number of military revolvers, a number of military pistols, and I'm going to tell you that the 1911 and World War I is among my first choices. Um, mostly because at this time, a lot of you are probably going, well, you know, I'd rather have a 9mm double stack or whatever, but those options just aren't really out there. You have 9mm Parabellum showing up in things like the C96 and the Luger, but they offer their own challenges. Whereas this gun right here, yes, it's a heavier cartridge that most people did not favor outside of the US and actually weirdly Norway. Um, they, yeah, Norway adopted the gun as well as the Model 14 with a slight improvement to the slide release. Um, but realistically, like most countries are not into this sort of big, you know, hard recoiling, uh, heavy hitting weapon. They just went ahead and had their pistol serve usually just as a symbol of office until the war kicked off. And then you see a lot of European countries scrambling around with 32 ACPs in a battlefield. And the U.S. is like, nah, we'll just go for, like, the U.S. had a stronger pistol culture. Like, it, a handgun was sort of second nature to a lot of countries to the U.S. because I guess with the, the Western expansion and everything like that, we really had gotten used to the idea of having an all-around good handgun. And so that's why you see so much care in the adoption of this one versus other countries just going, yeah, this kind of works, this will be fine. It's not like we're betting a war over it. Um, and then in terms of the revolvers, it's hard to beat either Colt or Smith & Wesson revolver from that period because both are fit so well and timed so well. And then also both of these guns came about, you know, in the short decades after all the problems with the first swing out cylinders falling out of time from Colt. So Colt has changed their rotational direction. Um, as a matter of fact, here, let me zoom in on this. Like we saw before with the other one, when I pulled that hammer back, it would rotate over to the left, pushing against the crane. In this case, they've changed it. They've shifted it to torque into itself so that it doesn't walk out of time over years of use. And then the Smith & Wesson has the same rotation to the left that should be a problem, but they added a reinforcer up here. So right at the uh, front of our sort of ejector push rod, so again, open, you would simultaneously eject like that. But also that spring pressure pushes a dimple forward that rests on a little notch here that's spring powered. So that keeps all that from putting too much lateral pressure on the crane and therefore walking out of time. Yeah, so ultimately, U.S. only has three considerations for a handgun. Uh, they went very strongly with the 1911. This has its own mythos. You guys don't need me to tell you a lot about this. There's tons of stuff on the internet on these. The 1917s did three things really well. They allowed you to use existing assembly lines. They allowed you to use that 45 rimless ammo that's standard in a revolver with that half-moon clip. And then three, like we kind of talked about, they allowed... Colt to not necessarily have to go crazy and start trying to file for lawsuits or back royalties or something for somebody else producing the 1911. These guns, the designs of which were both already owned by their respective companies, although this is a Colt gun, so Colt would have Colt's permission. But um, it's just one of those things where it's like, we have an existing line, we don't have to get into an entanglement over rights, we can just produce this gun and have it share the ammo. And you'll see these, if you notice, if you pay close attention to the pictures, a lot of times you will see a 1917 sort of butt sticking out of a holster for a lot of US servicemen, even up to the front line. So these were good, reliable revolvers. And then at the rear line, you would have the last, uh, 
grandpa's technology, uh, the new army, which at this point we're getting fairly long in the tooth and we're probably not used in active service, more so with Navy and guards and things like that. Now, do you have you done any episodes on your channel about any of these specific weapons? Currently, the only ones that we've covered are the new armies. Uh, the 1911 episode is on the way. There's some contract pieces in different uh, chamberings that I would like to talk about because the guns were also given over to Britain and sold over to Russia. Uh, and I'd really like to be able to talk about those. So we've been holding out towards the end of the series to get that done in proper fashion. And then these 1917 should be coming up pretty soon. They have two very distinct evolutions. So we're going to break into two distinct episodes um, because there's brave, basically for both of these, there's precursor models that serve with other countries. So it's fine to talk about them totally independently because they're often confused for being the same gun because they have the same model year and the same caliber, but they work quite differently and they both came from different places. Okay, everybody. Well, uh, thank you, Othias, once again. And that was great for today. Uh, now, if you'd like to see his episode about the Colt New Arm, me, uh, you, you can click right here for that. And if you have not subscribed to his channel, you should go over there and do it right now because you get to see people firing the guns and you learn all kinds of things about the guns. Uh, Othias, say goodbye to everybody out there. Yeah, and thank you guys for tuning in. And like Indy said, if you're curious about any of this, come check us out. There's a lot of story to these old small arms that goes beyond just sort of point and shoot. It talks a lot about industrial history, opinions about how the war should have been done, and then opinions about how it was actually going during the war when they changed their minds. Well, that's what I think is most fascinating. That's why I think uh, it, your channel is really fun and is a great compliment to like what we do that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, okay, well, uh, I'll say for the third time, thank you very much. And everybody, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and all of your dreams will come true unless they involve shooting people with guns, in which case they probably won't. See you next time.